uh, I'm going to start a little bit philosophically here <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then work into something very technical. Uh, I have come to believe that we are not designed to live as hierarchical beings, that every person is infinitely valuable and no one is any more or less valuable or important than anyone else. So that view has gotten me in trouble more than once, especially when I've stood up for someone that someone who was important thought was one of the little people. But um, if that belief is true then, it's not just a courtesy for me to, to learn something about you. It's a necessity before we can communicate. So I'd like to start, I'd like to ask you a few questions, learn something about you, and then move into what we're talking about. Uh, my first question is, how many of you here would, would call yourself software developers? Okay, great. How many of you would call yourselves managers of software development? Okay, great. Uh, how many don't fit in either of those categories? That's great. Um, can some of you who don't fit in either of those categories just kind of call out what it is that you do? Don't <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a two or three word phrase. Systems assurance. Systems excellent, excellent. Yeah, very important. Systems architecture. Systems architecture, all right. Process improvement. Process improvement, excellent. Sort of a, a dimmingite among us, maybe? A little bit? Yes. Programming language designer. Excellent. Okay. Fascinating. Anybody else want to call out one out real quick? Okay. Let's, uh, let's go on to something a little bit deeper then. How many of you love software development? Excellent. Okay. So how many of you love the reality of developing software as much as you love the idea of developing software. <laughs> it's a much smaller uh, sample there. Um, <clears throat> this is just as I thought. The idea of developing software is beautiful. You know, it's, it's very elegant. Sometimes the reality of developing software, though, can be brutal, can't it? Especially when you're on a failed project. Uh, can you, do you remember the worst project that you've ever been on? Do you remember what it was like? Do you remember what it was like when you would, the alarm would go off in the morning, you'd look at the alarm and think, oh my, I've got to go back to work today. Do you remember were the people, when you got there, were the people smiling at each other? What was the tone of the, the office? Were people eager to push credit off on someone else even if, it, even if they deserved a piece of it. In that environment, it's kind of every, every person for themselves, isn't it? Dog eat dog. So the negatives of a failed program hurt everyone. And this is the reason why I'm so passionate about making projects successful. This has been the theme of my career all the way through. Because successful projects are good for people. They're good for you, they're good for me, and they're good for everyone out there that we are serving with our, with our work. So <clears throat> with that, we'll, we'll go into the technical content here. Does, do you all remember some, what we used to call the software crisis? Back in the 80s and 90s, it's what we, it, that's how we called the uh, projects being late, being over budget, and not satisfying our customers. Back in those days, in those bad old days, we were told by primarily the Standish Group, who kept the statistics on this, that only 25% of all projects were successful. Well, let's see how things are today. The same group tells us that there's been a stunning improvement. This is as of 2007, the latest report. Well, what does a stunning improvement mean? 
Well, it means we've gone from 25% successful all the way up to 35% successful. Well, I don't know about you, but when I took my second grade elementary school sums, 35% successful was the same thing as 65% unsuccessful. Two out of every three projects are still unsuccessful. Now, the same people also gathered the data to tell us that when a customer spent 100 cents on software, they got 59 cents worth of value. Well, in fourth grade, my class in division taught me that that kind of a ratio means that they are overpaying by 70%. <laughs> so, the irony is that this problem has already been solved. There are organizations right now that set out to have successful projects, and by golly, they have successful projects, beginning to end. Uh, Rod Chapman and Praxis, good example. We've got a number of those. So it, it, it can be done. The problem has already been solved. And in fact, I would say it's outrageous that in our industry that we still tolerate this kind of performance when the problem has been solved. Now, W. Edwards Deming, the, the quality guru, uh, used to say that the, the buck stops at the, at the door of senior management. In the US, we would say that are, those are the people that get the multi-million dollar bonuses, like at AIG. Um, those are the people who can do something about it. The people that are in this room, by and large, it's difficult for us to leverage that, especially if we work for large companies. But it's, it can be solved. And those folks, I believe, shouldn't take another luxury vacation and should not take another million dollar bonus until the problem is solved in their organizations. It can be done. Okay, so why, so, so why do programs fail or projects fail? Well, it really boils down to something very simple. It boils down to the amount of cost to develop the amount of value delivered when you start out, <clears throat> it, you, you spend less to develop the, the worth of the value delivered to your customers, but at some point, if the cost goes above the value, then you don't have a viable project anymore. If you can't get customers to pay you what it costs you to develop your, your, your software, your project, you either end the project or you start subsidizing the project from your other revenues. Neither of those is a viable business case. In this article, uh, they gave uh, three specific cases of uh, causes for the cost going exponential. And I'm not going to belabor that. You've got that in your notes. You can look at it. But each of those actually has a reflection in the choice of programming language. So the key here is however you do it, you have to prevent the cost of development from going exponential. <clears throat> uh, I thought this was, this, this was a good quote, that uh, when you choose the wrong language, that can do you in. There have been another, uh, a number of big projects, though, that could never be successfully integrated. The uh, auto advanced automation system software, for instance, was never successfully integrated. Now, that was the, the biggest debacle in the history of software development. $3.7 billion spent over uh, a, many, many years. And there's many reasons why that project went wrong. But one of the reasons was that it could not be integrated. So integration, again, is a characteristic, or support for integration is a characteristic of programming languages. 